Okay, friends, open up to the Second Timothy passage. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Second Timothy chapter 2. And as we're turning there, I just want to say again what a delight it is to be back together again today outdoors. You know, I, I, it struck me that uh, coming up on her first birthday, July 9th, today is actually Selah's first time in church. So let's welcome Selah to church. Great to see you. There's a lot of work that goes into doing these outdoor services. And, you know, one of the risks that you run anytime you thank someone is that you, you know, leave out someone who should be thanked. But um, I want to say a special thank you to Brian and his team, uh, to Joe, to the entire AV team, to Dave Neeb for all the setups that you did. He built this cool little MacGyver cart over here that makes it all work. Uh, to Deb, who's worked hard at making communion possible. Thank you all on behalf of your church family. Next, next Sunday, you can expect to see me in shorts with a hat. <laughs> There's just not enough lettuce on top. I'm probably going to get a sunburn, but uh, it's worth it to be together. Okay, are you at 2 Timothy chapter 2? That's where you should be by now. Today we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness. With, with your Bibles open to 2 Timothy, let me just remind you of Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things there is no law. We've been tracking through the fruit of the Spirit over the last few weeks in order to present a third way to Christians, right? The, the world tells you that you need to fall into one of two categories, uh, liberal or conservative, left or right. But Christians know that there's actually a third way, a better way, to navigate tumultuous days, and that is to walk by the Spirit. When you walk by the Spirit and you begin to see these fruit of the Spirit growing and presenting in your life more and more, um, you find that there is a third and better way to navigate uncertain days and uncertain times, such as the ones we live in. And so today we're going to zero in on faithfulness. Now, faithfulness is one of those virtues that has not shifted with our shifting culture. Okay, so over the last hundred years, maybe less, even especially over the last few years, so many things that we held as virtues in our society have ebbed and flowed or outright flipped on their head, right? Things that we used to think were virtuous, we now look at and think are somehow vice. Things that we used to think were vice, we now look at as virtuous. Interestingly, faithfulness is one of those that has remained. It has endured. Everyone in our world today would look at the virtue of faithfulness and say, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. Faithfulness to your friends, faithfulness to your convictions, faithfulness to your family, even faithfulness to your employers, and certainly faithfulness to your spouse, to your partner. Now, this one is really interesting, right? It exposes how important faithfulness is and how it works. If you talked in general to the random person, let's say you're a barista at Starbucks or whatever, and you asked them about sexual ethics, What's fascinating is that there's been a massive shift in sexual ethic, especially over the last 40 years or so, 50 years, to the point that almost anyone you encounter would think that it's entirely okay to have sex with people on a first date, on a hookup, regularly, informally, without any underpinning of relationship, and certainly there doesn't need to be marriage. That's how far we've shifted on that virtue. And yet, to a person... Even the most secularly informed person would say that cheating is wrong, right? Think about that. So what they're saying is, it's fine to have any kind of sexual expression that you wish to have, but once you enter into um, a committed relationship, then faithfulness is a virtue that must be observed. No matter how, se no matter how secular you are, you still hold to that value. Isn't that interesting? I think that's because the opposite of faithfulness is so repugnant. The opposite of faithfulness is betrayal. When there is an agreed upon terms of relationship, 
right? When you come to some kind of agreement, whether it's with a spouse or an employer or a conviction or something, if you betray that in large ways or in small, it's actually something that we collectively find repugnant. You say, well, what about the faithfulness, man, right? I thought we were all agreed on how this relationship was going to work and then somehow something comes along and sweeps the legs out from under it. Faithfulness is vitally important because we recognize how ugly betrayal is. Now, betrayal can take different forms. It can be something massive that leads to the enormous and cataclysmic breakdown of a relationship, right? There can be a sense of betrayal in a moment that's almost impossible to fix or very difficult to recover from. But then there's also incremental betrayals that can happen in small ways in any relationship. And, and those are like the um, little foxes that spoil the vine. They erode faithfulness in small ways. That happens in our lives and in our interpersonal relationships. But I also think that that's what's happening to some extent in our society and in our world today. We can probably agree that our, our world is in turmoil. People have this nagging sense that something is wrong, something is off. And you know, part of that is born out of this idea of betrayal. We collectively have in society an unspoken social contract. Are you familiar with the idea of a social contract from Jean-Jacques Rousseau? This idea that anytime you get people together in any kind of community or society, there are unwritten rules on which we all operate. That's the social contract. And faithfulness to that social contract, even though it's not explicit, is um, what shapes our expectations. And so collectively, I think people are looking out at the world and saying, man, things are not unfolding the way that faithfulness to the social contract would demand. Things in society appear unjust and unfair. There's like this betrayal of this social contract that I thought we were all supposed to remain faithful to. This virtue of faithfulness and its counterpoint of betrayal is not only in our own lives, but we can also see it demonstrated all around us in the world. When things appear to work out in ways that are undeserved and unexpected. You think, well, that's a breach and a betrayal of our agreement. 2 Timothy chapter 2, I trust you have it open by now. We're going to look at verses 8 to 19. This passage describes this Christian virtue of faithfulness. And in order to really get at it, we have to begin by considering the context. Okay, so let me just paint a picture, a bit of a picture for you here. Paul is writing this at the end of his life. Did you know that 2 Timothy is actually the last letter of Paul contained in our Bibles? And so what you're getting here is Paul's swan song. And so all of what Paul says is canon. It's all scripture. It's all the word of God. But somehow people's last words carry a little bit more weight, don't they? When we come to 2 Timothy, we find Paul at the end of his life and in prison. You know, he's not only at the end of his life and in prison, but his journey of serving the Lord and giving his entire life to serving the Lord and to serving the Lord's people has been a hard life at that. And after a very difficult life, he talks about being beaten and stoned and whipped and shipwrecked and left for dead serving the Lord. After a very hard life, he's at the end. And it's only harder. Look at chapter 1, verse 15, if you have it in front of you. He's taking stock of his life, and he says, All in Asia have abandoned me. In other words, he's saying, at the end of his life when he's in prison, every single one of those churches that he planted has turned their backs on him in his hour of greatest need. All in Asia have abandoned me. Further in verse 15, the cruelest cut. You can hear it in the text, right? His closest friends, Phygelus and Hermogenes, even his closest friends had turned their backs on him and betrayed him. Flip ahead to chapter 4, verse 14. You find that his avowed enemy, Alexander the coppersmith, has not relented in persecuting Paul. 
chapter 4, verse 16. Paul says, when I was standing in my first appearance at court, everyone deserted me at the time of my most desperate need. Talk about betrayal. Talk about a lack of faithfulness in friendship. If we drop ourselves into this moment, we find a Christian man who has endeavored to serve the Lord his entire life, and in the end, he is betrayed by his friends. He's mistreated by his enemies and abandoned. We can even wonder if Paul is feeling somehow betrayed by his social contract. Life hasn't turned out the way that he expected or the way that he hoped for. Is it possible that in these moments, Paul is even feeling betrayed by his contract with God? We all have these provisional social contracts with God. Sometimes they're biblical, sometimes they're just of our own making, right? We look and we say, well, God, I've done so much for you. You owe me one, God. What about throwing the $70 million lotto max my way? Or more seriously, we have this unspoken social contract with God where we think that by virtue of the fact that we are so good and so good for him, then nothing bad should ever happen to us. And so maybe Paul had a bit of that at the end of his life. The apostle of the Gentiles, faithful to Christ through persecution. And here he finds himself all alone, in prison, betrayed and abandoned by everyone. Things haven't worked out like he expected. I am um, celebrating my 46th birthday this year. And so a lot of my friends are right about the same age as me. You know, we're all balding, middle-aged men. And I think that this phenomenon is one that plagues middle-aged men. Perhaps middle-aged women as well, but I can't really speak to that. You get to a point in your life in your mid-40s or early 50s where something in your life hasn't worked out the way you expected. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your family or your marriage or something, and you take stock of it and you have this gnawing feeling that somehow in the process, it's not what you expected. You feel betrayed by life or you feel, and, and, and middle-aged men, that's why they go off and grow ponytails and get earrings and buy sports cars, right? This sense of betrayal. This hasn't, life hasn't panned out the way I thought it should. Well, here's Paul. He's given himself to the Lord completely. He's given himself to serving the Lord's people and planting the Lord's churches for his entire life. And he finds himself at the end of his life, not with faithful friends, but he finds himself betrayed. What should he do? Can you feel the weight of that moment? What should he do in response? Should he return betrayal for betrayal? That would seem just, wouldn't it? All those churches in Asia, they've abandoned me. Phygelus and Hermogenes, yeah, to heck with them, right? Didn't need them anyway. Isn't that what he should do? Well, he'd be well within his rights to do so. And yet, look at what he says to Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 8. Paul is passing the baton of ministry onto this young protege, Timothy. And in this moment, at the end of his life, in prison, betrayed by everyone, verse 8, Paul says to Timothy, Remember Jesus. Do you see that in the text? Chapter 2, verse 8. These two words that summarize and actually define the fruit of the Spirit that is faithfulness, remembering Jesus, that's faithfulness. You know, in, in a very real sense, the only reason that you are a Christian man or woman today is because Christians before you endured hardship pressed through suffering, and remained faithful to Christ. That's the only reason that the gospel has been passed from one generation to the next, because of faithful Christians who spread the gospel to the likes of people like you and me. Who played that role in your life? 
Who was the faithful Christian for you? Was it a parent, a grandparent, a friend, a co-worker, maybe even a stranger? Someone whose faithfulness to Christ has produced the fruit of you being a Christian today. Well, here's Paul at the end of his road. Verse 9, he says he's suffering in chains as a criminal for the gospel, but the word of God is not bound. Verse 10, therefore I endure for the sake of the elect that they may inherit eternity. Paul says he's standing at the end of his life, he's taking stock, he knows that he's been betrayed by everyone, and yet he says, I endure for you. That's what he's saying. I endure for the sake of the Christians that are yet to come. Timothy, I'm enduring for you. The church in Ephesus, I'm enduring for you. And friends here at St. George's out on the grass in the hot blazing sun, Paul endured betrayal and hardship for you. We are Christians because Paul endured and returned faithfulness for betrayal. I want to to jump into a couple of verses in particular, and then we're going to wrap. Here's Paul's accounting of Christian faithfulness. There are four couplings, okay? There are four sets of two. Three of them are what you're going to expect, and the fourth one is a bit of a twist. Verses 11 to 13. This, um, these couple of verses are something of a contract, right? They are a faithfulness ledger. They're how God works, how Christian faithfulness works. So, so let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 11. It says what? If we die with him, then what? We will live with him. That's the first statement that Paul's saying as a contract of faithfulness. If you die with Christ, you will live with him. Friends, there is nothing more precious and sweet in the sight of God than the death of a saint. Just yesterday, we were at Don George's funeral, Monty and I. And of course, we're sad to see Don go. I've heard from so many in our church how he would come up along quietly on Sunday mornings and just bring words of encouragement to so many of you. We're sad to see him go. But I was just overwhelmed with gratitude at the faithful witness of this brother who died in Christ, faithful to the end. Can I get an amen? That's good stuff. That's good stuff. If you die with him, you will live with him. (laughs) Talk about faithfulness. Verse 12. If you endure with him, what? You will reign with him. Dying with Christ leads to living with Christ. Enduring with Christ leads to reigning with Christ. That's why back in the beginning of chapter 2, Paul gives the pictures of a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. I'm not going to get into those. You can look them up yourself. Endure with him, you will reign with him. Okay, so die with him, live with him. Endure with him reign with him. Two positive couplings. Now we flip the contract. You ready? Verse 12b. If you deny him, what does it say? He will deny you. If you deny him, he will deny you. That's consistent with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. Well, that's one that should make us tremble in our boots, doesn't it? Because we all deny Christ in large and small ways at different times. So what's Paul talking about here? Well, one of the best pictures that offers us insight into this is Peter's denial of Jesus. Do you remember that one? Three times? I don't know the guy never even seen him. I don't know who he is. Leave me alone. Do you remember that, Peter? Denied Jesus three times. How did that work out? 
While Jesus appeared to him, Peter repented and the Lord Jesus Christ made Peter the rock on which the church was built. So what Paul's getting at here is not the moments of weakness that we have in our Christian journey. Those do not result in God denying us. The Lord only denies those who fully and finally shove him away as an act of their will. If you stubbornly reject Jesus, the warnings of Scripture are dire. It's what Jesus talked about when he talked about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Do you remember that passage? He said this is the only unforgivable sin. If you reject the forgiveness that is yours in Christ, he will reject you. This isn't talking about moments where we waver in our faithfulness of Christ. That's not what it's talking about. It's a warning against apostasy. It's a warning against rejecting it. It's a warning against when the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you of sin and tries to press you into the grace of Jesus. It's a warning against deflecting that moment and saying, whatever. All right, here we go. Here's the contract so far. If you die with him, you'll live with him. If you endure with him, you'll reign with him. If you deny him, he'll deny you. Verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Well, there's a couple different possibilities for understanding this one, and I struggled with this this week. It's an assurance that God will remain faithful to himself, that God will always be who he is. He cannot deny his character. And it either means... Okay, you with me so far? It either means that the faithfulness of God to his character means that he will not blink at sin bringing wrath and judgment. Okay, that's one possibility of what it means. It means if we are faithless, he will remain faithful to who he is as the holy judge and bring wrath and judgment. That's one possibility. But I think the other possibility is more consistent with the overall context of the letter and the New Testament. See, Paul is setting up a twist. He's setting up a gospel surprise. He's just given you three. This equals this. This equals this. This equals this. And so you get to the fourth one, and you think this is going to equal this. But what he's saying is, no, no, no. This equals something totally different. It's a rhetorical device where he's trying to surprise you. Die, live. Reign, endure, reign. Deny, denied. Faithless, what do you expect? You expect faithless back. But Paul says, even when you are faithless, he remains faithful. You see, contained in this part of the contract is actually both. God is promising to remain faithful and true to his character. He cannot deny himself. And so how that faithfulness of God to his character plays out in your life depends on whether you are in Christ or not. The promise is he will remain faithful to who he is. That just looks different depending on the person. When you are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He will always be true to himself and to his word. Faithfulness to himself will lead to one of two different outcomes, both of which are expressions of his unwavering faithfulness to who he is. If you are under God's mercy, there's one outcome of his faithfulness. If you are under God's wrath, there's another. You see, friends, you and I will be faithless. We will have moments, big and small, where we betray and deny Christ. His faithfulness to his character means that you and I will get what is just. According to his unchanging character, which he cannot deny. And so what Paul's saying here is, if you have been born again, then every sin, both past 
present, and future has been paid for by the blood of God the Son on the cross. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, therefore, it's no longer mercy but justice that you are forgiven. God can't deny his character. He's not blinking at your sin or overlooking your sin. He's looking at your sin and saying, the price has been paid in full by Jesus on the cross. And so it's no longer God's mercy that saves you. It's his justice. He's both just and the justifier. He will remain faithful to his character. If you are in Christ, your justice looks like forgiveness. If, however, you are not, then Paul warns throughout the New Testament that you remain an object of God's wrath. We saw that last week in Ephesians chapter 2. And his justice will bring about judgment and eternal damnation because God has to remain faithful to who he is. And so here's the gospel. God is faithful and just. He cannot deny who he is, period. This is terrible and dreadful news for anyone who's not hidden in Christ. But it's glorious gospel for anyone who's been born again. You are not saved by your faithfulness. If you are faithful, Paul says, well, let, let me say it. When you, are faith, when you are faithless, he remains faithful because he set his affection upon you in Jesus. Your sin has been judged and paid for in full on the cross and it would be unjust for God to judge the same sin twice. That is the faithfulness of God to you. Even when you fail the faithfulness test, he cannot deny himself. He will remain faithful. In other words, you are not strong enough to fall away when God has handed you over to the Son. Even when you are faithless, God remains faithful. So let me finish with the applications. So there are two different applications to this passage on faithfulness. Two different possibilities. The first one is if you're sitting here today or if you're watching from home and you are under the wrath of God. You're feeling uncomfortable and it's not because I'm emotionally manipulating you. It's because the Holy Spirit is convicting you. It's because God loves you too much to leave you comfortable in your sin and under his wrath. Your only escape is to flee from your sin and turn to your Savior. The second application is for those of us today who are in Christ, but perhaps lacking assurance. promise from this scripture is that the faithfulness of God to you in Jesus eclipses even your own faithlessness. That'd be a good moment for an amen. Even at times when you betray Christ, he remains faithful to you. Now verse 15 tells us that it's God's faithfulness that makes you faithful. Look at that, that that phrase, a worker approved by God. So what this means is that when we press into the faithfulness of God in Christ to us, you begin to feel this security and this confidence and this assurance. And that is when the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness begins to grow in your life. When you feel that even when I am faithless, God remains faithful. He can't deny himself. I have been forgiven by God in Jesus Christ, and there's nothing in the world that could ever take that away. That's the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness. It grows. So you look at your life and you say, well, what do I do when things are not working out as I thought they should? Feeling betrayed by the social contract? feeling betrayed by that contract in society, in your own home, in your own life. 
maybe even feeling betrayed by that contract in your walk with the Lord? Here's the answer. Remember 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Even when you are faithless, God remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And thank God that things don't work out as they should. Thank God for that. And if you got what you deserved, if things worked out the way you should, that they should, you'd be damned to hell forever. His faithfulness is far greater than any of our betrayals. Even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. He cannot deny himself.